What if you tried to log into your bank app one day and you saw something like this, system unavailable. And then you go, okay, it could be routine maintenance. So you go on to uh, the newspaper and you see something like this, Silicon Valley Bank, regulars, regulators take over as failure raises fears. Wow. So obviously you're probably panicking by now, right? You can't log in the website, but heck, if you did, you'd be withdrawing money. So you go to a local branch to see what's going on. And of course, maybe withdraw money. And how's that look like? Looks a little bit like this. Lines and lines of people, right? Looks a little bit more like this. Lines and lines of people lining up and trying to get in and withdraw some money. But down these stairs, I'll show you what it looks like. It looks a little bit like this. You'll see, you'll see uh, just a gentleman all right, once you go down there, it looks a little bit like this. He's there to reassure you, to comfort you. He's from the government. He's from the FDIC. And he'll say one thing, or rather two things. If you are have less than 250K, well, you're insured. So you're okay. But if you have over 250K, well, you know, can't help you. Best of luck. Hey, see you later. Bye. That's pretty much it. That's how it goes for a lot of the people who had their money or companies rather that had their money in Silicon Valley Bank, right? This is the second largest bank failure in US history. And also not just that, biggest one since 2008, big, first major bank collapse since 2008 caught all of us off guard. So I'm going to look into how this happened. And then we're going to apply this to could this happen to other banks and the probability of it right we're going to look at the conditions that led to this and by the end of this video we're going to see what contagion might look like how this could affect other countries or rather if other countries have the similar problems coming up and also wider effect on you know the silicon valley economy or local economies as, as well as what the federal reserve can or cannot do from this point on because we risk a major major financial crisis if something like this gets replicated on a larger scale, I want to go into exactly what that might look like in this video. So let's get into exactly uh, what uh, the, the balance sheet looks like. We need to go into the numbers today. So let's do it, right? At the end of 2021, the bank had $190 billion in deposits. Now, by the end of 2022, we had 173. So around the 20, $26 billion withdrawal during that year and depositors in banks uh, are fine to withdraw it's completely fine but the problem is if they keep withdrawing there's no more money in the bank right it's pretty much a bank run what's worse is that just put in context there's 173 billion as of the end of last year and at that point the report said uh, at least the the earnings report said 151 of that 173 billion was not insured, was over the 250K. So the majority of money or people with that you know, banked here uh, are not going to be insured. They're probably going to lose uh, their money, maybe all, but at least a lot of it, right? Uh, if not the majority of it. So it could get really gnarly. Now, uh, why does this, what does this, uh, how does this affect the bank? Like, does my local bank have this issue too? Well, not to the extent of Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank serviced a lot of Silicon Valley businesses or startups that required venture capital and other investments to keep them going, particularly if, you know, as they were, particularly a lot of them aren't are profitable quite yet. So they'll require uh, money to come in. Now, if they don't have money or profits coming in and, you know, investors don't really want to invest with them because the interest rates are so high, it doesn't make sense to speculate on tech firms they're going to be withdrawing the money to use naturally, right? Now, here comes the hiccup. When they withdraw the money because of what the bank has invested in, which are uh, primarily uh, bonds with the government that were yielding a very low yield. Now, with the high interest rates, what happened was that uh, they lost money on the, those uh, bonds. Uh, bonds. So basically, let, let's get the details right, correct, all right? Uh, yeah, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, was forced to sell $21 billion worth of bonds with an average duration of 3.6 years. So what this actually means is that, as well as 
a, a yield of 1.8%. What they did in in last two years was they bought 21 billion at least of bonds, which only gave them 1.2% of return back, right? They never expected the interest rates to go up so quickly. Now, that's on them. And it, those bonds would finish, would pay out after an average of 3.6 years. So they were locked in to those bonds, right? Those bonds didn't finish up uh, in time, right? So those bonds, of course, are still going right now. Uh, let's say approximately 3.6 years left. So they can't back out of that. They can back out of it only at a loss because the market right now is 5%, right? And they bought it something at that time at 5 1.8%. Now, in order to, to sell it, they have to sell it so that uh, the, the cost of this thing, the price is is lower as to justify uh, why the buyer would buy it because the buyer still needs 5%. So let's say they bought the bond at 100 bucks and they're going to get 102 bucks back. Well, to make that, to square that up, they can only sell at 97, right? Because the the, the, the person or the company buying it needs to get 5% out of it. So 102 minus, you know, 97, you still get five back approximately. Obviously, there's a little bit of difference there, but that's the way it is. Now, what that actually means is that uh, they had to do that with $21 billion uh, to plug the to plug this gap or plug these, these these withdrawals and you know coming withdrawals and by the way the interest rates are continuing to go up so they're locked here and the situation is going to get worse right now this is this is essentially what happened and they were forced over the last week to actually sell and announce pretty much to the world that you know we're selling it and we need a bit more money to keep going and that's when it, 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 the the um the sh TF when it really got bad. So Moody's asked them, they knew Moody's is a um, you know credit agency. They asked them to sort of deal with these unrealized losses on their balance sheet with these bonds and to either sell them off and get more liquidity to you know uh, facilitate these withdrawals uh, or just stick with it and we're going to give you a massive downgrade uh, which would also trigger an exodus from the sort of investors or depositors anyway. Now, what was funny was that Goldman Sachs, their advisor, they, along with their advisor, decided to sell, right? Sell that portfolio, the 21 billion, right? And they would have had a $1.8 billion loss, somewhere around that order. And announced, what they did was announce that we want to, we want to sell shares at $2.25 billion with an equity deal, right? Announced it to the market and therefore, Okay, hunky dory, we can solve this problem. It makes sense. It makes up for the shortfall of around two billion dollars. We're gonna ask for two billion dollars of investor capital. We'll be fine, right? No, they weren't. They were downgraded anyway by Moody's, right? And then this is pretty much what happened the next day. Let me get the chart of Silicon Valley Bank. Massive sixty percent drop. The market. There was a trading halt, but uh, initiated by a market no longer trades as of that point. Within those, you know, a couple of hours of uh, operations, $42 billion were withdrawn in that one single day. And what happened was at the end of the day of Thursday, March to 9th, the bank had a negative $1 billion of cash. And the only way to square things up also to balance things out was to sell more bonds right just to operate keep the lights on i guarantee you if you're under if you're one billion dollars negative you still need to get the cash somewhere to do any, anything so what happened was the fdic stepped in and took receivership control of the bank and uh you know initiated this program to get you know the 250k dollars uh back to the, the depositors and so on and so forth and sort out the bankruptcy proceedings now how did sort of uh how did this happen? Well, this this is I can I can explain one sentence. Interest rate rises, right? And that affects everyone. It affects my balance sheet, you know, my finances at home. It affects probably your business and your finances. You know, it also affects my my uh business, as you can say, and my portfolio, definitely. Right? It affects everyone. Every single bank that has bought any bond or any investment now has the pressure 
of higher interest rates to facilitate for depositors. And if uh, the, the depositors want to withdraw their money, they may have to sell now at a loss because most things, including stocks, you can see the stock or price compared to you know a year or two ago, everything has dropped in value, right? So everything you sell off because of valuations, unless you're talking about buying oil or gold or something like that, has completely fallen off the cliff. So they're forced to take L's and at some point they're gonna go under too. So that's a simple explanation. And the question is, is how far can we lift interest rates up before affecting the real economy? Now I'm gonna give you an example of how this has affected the real economy is in Silicon Valley. Uh, Valley. I don't have, you know, skin the game in Silicon Valley. You know, I don't particularly have, you know, a anything to do with it. You know, I don't have a love for the place, but let's go on to some real businesses affected by this, right? We're talking about USDC run by Circle, right? Which is a crypto stable coin, one of the biggest stable coins in the crypto space. Um, so that it's, so Silicon Valley Bank is one of the six banking partners, right? Uh, so they're going to lose money on that. Roku, who make, yeah, they make like uh, streaming video gadgets, you could say. They, 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 they have money in there. BlockFi, another crypto outfit, they have money in there too. Roblox, a gaming company uh, or, you know, Web 3.0, Metaverse company, they have cash in there. Uh, there are medical companies in there. Uh, and it just keeps going, you know, payment companies, you know, more bioscience companies. And I'm sure we would have got a lot, or we still might get a lot of innovation out of these companies. I mean, there are companies that are too small to list. It affects the whole community there. Um, you know, these guys are not able to access their money. They're not going to be able to pay the next payroll, perhaps. The employees are not going to be able to get the paycheck. They may have to furlough or fire you know this you know workers throughout this whole community it's going to be uh an onslaught it's going to be carnage to these uh you know potential future companies of america it's tragic if you think about it then these guys have spent their whole lives uh and risked everything to build these companies and it's pulled uh pulled away in in literally one day that thursday everything collapsed right they announced that they needed a bit more money on wednesday next day 42 billion dollars later out it's finished and that's just how it is and they may not be able to see their money for months and uh, these companies a lot don't all, don't work on profit now they need cash injection uh so you know this is this is the community and economic you know, effects on the economy but which other banks are in line and could be affected too let's have a look remember a lot of these banks a lot of banks do have to buy t1 assets and different assets on the balance sheet as collateral, right? And that collateral with higher interest rates is worth less as, you know, when I explained uh, with the, uh, how we're pricing bonds. So let's look at some of the other banks and which banks may be affected. Now we saw actually that First Republic fell by 14.84%, but reality of the day, trading day, actually it dropped about 50, well, let me get it clearer for you. It dropped 50, three percent at the lowest and now it's banks bounced back up so this is a regional bank as well as a bank pack west that dropped 37 percent signature bank 22 percent western alliance 21 percent massive drop and it dropped furthermore you know it pretty much dropped 50 percent if i look closely if not more than that i mean 72 dollars here in space of two days it's now it dropped all the way down to 30 so that's well over half, you know, maybe 60% drop, really, uh, Western Alliance. If I was with your, these type of banks, I'd be withdrawing money ASAP. I don't care. Even if I was under the the insurance level, I'd still withdraw it. I mean, you know, it's your money. I mean, it's hard earned money. Who cares, right? You, want me, you don't want to be left holding the bag. Uh, as well as these other, you know, this is just a couple of different uh, regional smaller banks that I've seen and these smaller banks are going to struggle because they're not as regulated as the large banks like JP Morgan or Citibank. So they can actually buy, they can make stupid investments, frankly, right? Without the government or regulators looking over their shoulder. But JP Morgan or something like that, 
The government's watching over their shoulder all the time. They have to justify every investment to make sure it's not risky. They cannot take the risk that Silicon Valley Bank took when they locked themselves in for more than three years on 1.8% uh, uh, interest, even though I have to service now 5%. So, you know, uh, these banks do not have the same regulations. There's a probability that they've also made dumb investing decisions. Obviously, hindsight's 2020, but let's just call it what it is. And you can see a sea of red and it's just a massive decline. And in any interest rate environment that's going up, it's not good for the banks because the collateral value of that is going to go down. Now, what's really interesting is let's look at the big banks, speaking of which. Bank of America, um, not that much of a drop. They only dropped 1%. Citibank only dropped 0.5%. JP Morgan actually gained 2.5%. Uh, you know, even though there was a big drop before. Um, Goldman Sachs, minus 4.2%. Uh, so, you know, the bigger banks have come out a bit unscathed. So you could say they are less, the systematic banks perhaps, are less susceptible because they've done, done less bad investments. Well, I wouldn't call them stupid investments, but, you know, more uh, regulated um, and uh, curated uh, investments that had had the government uh, look over their shoulder with. So, but let's not, you know, let's not sugarcoat this, right? On Monday, when the banks open up, people are going to be withdrawing their money. Now, if they're withdrawing their money, they're forcing the banks to sell their collateral at a loss. Dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of banks, when the doors open on Monday, are going to see basically a bank run from the whole country. It's going to be carnage on them, and they're going to have to sell a lot of bonds. And by the way, the more bonds they sell on the market, the less they're valued, right? And the price is going to drop further because there's a lot of selling pressure. So for the next week, it's going to be really, watch your space. It's going to be so dangerous. And, you know, um, Janet Yellen actually said we're watching different banks right now to see who, well, she said we're watching a few banks to see which other banks are susceptible. So this could be, this could, this could go on and on and, um, you know, they have to compete for interest. You know, they're going to be losing depositors. They're going to be forced to sell. And then the more people hear about this, the more and more people want to withdraw their money. It's going to be, a you know, how do you say it? Cascading. It's going to cascade. It's going to get a life of its own, right? Now, I want to talk about another thing too. Global banks, uh, other banks, and what might be happening with other banks. So um, let's just go quickly to if what the response is, sorry, to uh, internationally, all right? And let's just go into my financials with banks across the world. And what is really interesting is that HSBC, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, they're, they're experiencing a massive drop from this, or well, this is the same thing in the Hong Kong stock market. Um, Mitsubishi Financial, which is very big in Japan, massive drop to 6% drop, right? CBA, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the largest bank in Australia, we're seeing a massive drop, 3.2%, relatively massive. Now, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Australian stock market is pretty damn stable uh, a lot of the times. So anyway, Barclays, UK, one of the biggest banks in the UK, is massive drops. You can see visually right there, 3.6%. Allianz, probably less so, the massive insurance company in Germany. Deutsche Bank, uh, again, minus 7.3%. So we're seeing uh, remnants of this across the world. Whatever Silicon Valley uh, Bank suffered or suffering from is going to affect every single other bank across the world because they're going to be faced with the pressure of withdrawals, pressure of losses from selling bonds and other assets, and they're going to take massive hits. And at a point where that massive hit is bigger than the whole valuation or the whole value of the company, it if they take such a massive charge, it's going to exacerbate. Customers are going to know, and then we'll, they're going to withdraw more money, right? And amplify this problem. It could spiral out of control. It's a vicious cycle. So that's what we're going to be looking at for at least the next couple of days or weeks until perhaps government steps in. We'll see. Now, 
I want to finish off, I know it's getting long, but I want to finish off with an idea for you to think about. So the Federal Reserve is going to have a meeting in March, you know, in a couple of days' time, really. And it's going to announce interest rate hikes, 25 uh, 0.25% or 0.5%, or even 0.75%. Now, what happens when we see a bank collapse because of high interest rates? Is he going to raise interest rates as aggressively? Right now, this is the first of perhaps many, but what you can say is that he's not going to be as enthusiastic about raising interest rates in the face of inflation. What happens if he doesn't raise interest rates as much, or he just you know backs out of raising interest rates? What that means higher inflation, perhaps hyperinflation, even if, if inflation is not controlled. Right, so this has dramatic implications for everyone. My portfolio of different investments, I'll need to relook at that. Cash sitting at the bank, I'll need to relook at that. You know, cash is going out of style with high and high inflation. What perhaps is the asset you need to invest in if you want to survive in this high inflation and perhaps not high interest rate environment or an environment of high interest rates that lead to banking failures across the world, financial crisis. What assets are good? Well, one asset you could consider, or any asset you consider, has to beat inflation, right? Or has to track inflation. That's probably gold or oil. So those two may be good. Um, are they the best? Perhaps. Now, my thinking is that gold is probably the winner, because gold is an inflation hedge. And gold usually is kept down if the interest rates go up, because you'd rather keep your money in the bank to get interest. but if the interest rates are not going to be going up and inflation is still going to go up, then perhaps gold is a good place. And we look at gold. Gold seems to be popping. Gold only went up 1.78%. Could be stronger if that fear is correct. So it's not 100% true. And if inflation is high, we're going to see have we're going to see oil popping up. And it went up marginally 1.27%. Uh, but you know, there's a long way to go to reach the previous highs. And the inflationary environment that is not going to be controlled is still going to have high energy costs. So that's something to think about. Um, and of course, when you're looking at the NASDAQ, that's going to get hammered. Uh, not too much, 0.32% drop, uh, as well as uh, S&P 500, minor, relatively minor drop, under the 200 moving average now, 057 But this is the in interesting one. Russell 2000, massive drops. The top 2,000 companies, smaller than the S&P 500, they're experiencing massive drops. So that's where the damage is, guys. So be careful out there. If you like the video, please hit the like button. Share if you think anyone is interested in this. I'd really appreciate that. And if you like more content like this, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. And uh, that ensures that you'll continue to see me more and more. Hopefully, I'm not annoying by that time. Uh, yeah, so, and you'll get to see more content just like this. Hopefully, you like this one. I shall see you in the next one. Ciao. Bye.